Welcome to LBC Online, we're so happy to have you. As you know, the UK and many parts of the world right now are on lockdown due to the coronavirus. And because of this, we are now entirely online. As a church, we really value our community and to continue building that community spirit and investing in that community, we're gonna be meeting together before and after our service online. You'll find the link below. And if you'd like to give to the church financially, you'll also find a link here below. Here at LBC, we like to start our services with worship, so wherever you are, grab the family, jump onto your feet and sing along with us. Your heart will lead me in your love. 
Thank you for joining us online again this morning. It's good to have you watching with us. Hopefully you were able to join us in the live part of our service on Zoom. If you weren't able to, don't worry, we're here again next week, 10.30. All the information is upon our website, www.loutonbaptistchurch.org. This is the part of the service where we turn to the scriptures. And I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 through to chapter 6, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16, from chap on to chapter 6, verse 2. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favour I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favour. Now is the day of salvation. Let's pray together. Father, still in this Easter season, we remind ourselves that Christ has been raised from the dead. He is risen. He is present with us by his Holy Spirit. And so we thank you. We thank you that he is alive. That he is amongst us. And by your Holy Spirit, Lord God, we ask that you may reveal him to us more clearly, more richly. That we may be in awe and wonder of the salvation that comes to us in his name. We thank you for your word. We thank you that this is the very word that brings life to us. May all of us who are watching, may all of us know new life in Christ as we hear your word and put it into practice. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most well-known stories that Jesus tells is what we often refer to as the parable of the lost son. It tells of a younger son who demands his inheritance from his father and then he takes it and squanders it in what the Bible refers to as wild living. Eventually he ends up coming to his senses as he soon finds himself destitute as a result of, of course, his own choices, but with that circumstances that are really outside of his control. He gets himself prepared then to return home. He's humbled and he's contrite. And yet to his astonishment and to ours as the reader of this story, his father is there longing and waiting for him. And so full of compassion for his son, the father runs and embraces him and welcomes him home with celebration. The father in this story is to remind us of God towards us. The son in the story is a lot like us. Despite how we have lived, despite of the decisions that we have made, God welcomes us with open arms, showing tremendous compassion and reconciling us to himself once again. As we've been going through a series on the message of the cross, the ver these verses remind us, and the story of the prodigal son also reminds us, that the message of the cross is one of reconciliation to God. It is of a relationship that is restored. 
restored at a cost to God himself in spite of who we are and what we have done. And that means, therefore, to trust in his death and his resurrection, the death and resurrection of Jesus, that is, is to trust that we are welcomed into the family of God and are reconciled to him as friends. The verses that we've then read in Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, they explain further how this happens and how we can therefore respond to it. We need to understand that the nature of reconciliation presumes that two parties are in a state of enmity, not just passively hostile towards one another, but actually actively so. Reconciliation then is to make enemies friends. It's, the, it's to allow the alienated to be included. It's for the broken to be healed. It doesn't mean to simply paper over the cracks, to pretend that the cause of the disruption has not occurred. It's actually to face up to the reality of the situation, the reality of the brokenness, and to resolve the cause of the disruption, realising that only when this is addressed can true friendship be restored. It is therefore not easy. It's not easy to achieve because the issues, the real issues of the brokenness, they have to be confronted and this is done at great cost. And this is what these verses are reminding us. And also what the parable of the lost son confirms for us. God has reconciled himself to us in Jesus Christ. The cause of the enmity between us, between us and God, is our sin. As we live our lives hostile to him. Christ, what he does then is he takes on himself the sins of the world. He suffers the penalty of that sin. He dies for each one of us that we may be pronounced right and reconciled to God. This is all God initiated. It's at a cost to himself as he offers his son as a sacrifice for our wrong. And so now through faith in him, through faith in Christ, we are, being, we are reconciled to God because our sins, we're told in these verses, are no longer counted against us. This action was not only so that you and I can be reconciled to God, but so that the whole world can be reconciled to God. In this action, the heart of God is revealed to us, demonstrating the same love as a father to the prodigal son, inviting others to have their relationship with him restored, that they may know new life in him. That means... The first thing that I want to remind you of this morning is that God has reconciled himself to you in Jesus Christ. And that means he no longer holds your sin against you. Now it may be the case that you're watching this online and you're longing to know God for yourself. It may be the case that you see yourself as far from God and how you have lived in the past or even how you are living in this present day it prevents you from coming to God. Well, God is the great reconciler. He is in fact not far off from each one of us and he's longing to have a relationship with you through his son and to welcome you into his family that you may know him and become a friend to him. It does require humility on our part, of course. We have to be willing to recognise that we aren't living as we should. Now, it may be extreme language to use, and it may be extreme language for us to consider as well, but the message of reconciliation is that we are to recognise that we are actively hostile to God, every one of us. But even this, God does not hold against us as we come contrite and humble to him. So every one of us can have a new life in Christ and begin a relationship with God today as his friend rather than as an enemy. Now for others who may be watching online, you are Christians and you already have a relationship with God. 
these verses are reminding us and encouraging us that God does not count our sins against us. And this is the wonder of the good news of Jesus Christ, that God does not bear grudges, but he welcomes the contrite and humble into his presence. So it may be the case that we are wrestling with a sense of guilt and fear about coming to God, perhaps because of the nature of our current relationship with him. It may be half-hearted, it may be lacklustre, it may be joyless, it may be confusing, but God does not hold this against us, but instead it, he invites humility from us with the opportunity to be drawn close to him. God, as the great reconciler, he doesn't want to leave us where we are. But he gives us the confidence to address those issues as we come to him. He is constantly encouraging us to address those areas in our lives that are broken or that we perceive as dead, that he may restore them in us. It may also be the case, however, that there is an aspect of our discipleship, our relationship with God, our, our lives in general, that we may not realise is actually affecting the vitality of our relationship with God at this time. We may be pursuing something, and persistently so, that goes against the very character of God and what he wants for you and what he wants for each one of us. Now, reconciliation comes when we address those areas in our lives. So let's not think that it doesn't affect us, but let's instead hear the invitation to confront those issues with grace that we may know God's forgiveness and a freshness to our relationship with God restored. It may be painful for us to do so, but the fruit of this response far outweighs the alternative. The second thing that I want to draw your attention to is in verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. What that means is having been reconciled to God in Christ, that we now become part of the ministry of reconciliation as ambassadors of Christ. That means we are re representing God in this world, going to places of different languages and cultures to tell others of this message of reconciliation and actively working with God to bring the effects of this message to the world. We're meant to note the, the vastness of the task, the scope of the task, if you like. Think about what ambassadors do for a moment. Ambassadors are sent to foreign lands to speak on behalf of those that they represent. Now these verses tell us that God was reconciling the world in Christ. The world in Christ. This therefore has cosmic implications because God is purposing that he is working to reconcile to himself all things. And this is what we are representing and joining with actively by pleading with others to be reconciled to God. This means that each one of us is an instrument of God's peace. So were we ever to be victims of injustice, the message of reconciliation means that we must learn to forgive. To those who have done the wrong, we must be ready to acknowledge that we have hurt others and address the pain that we have caused. And this is not just to be taking place between husband and wife or parents and children, but between ethnic groups and nations, between the religious denominations of our day, as well as within the political sphere, between managers and employees, between rich and poor. Where there is a need for reconciliation, Christians are to be ambassadors for Christ, encouraging and equipping people to face up to the, dis to the disruption that's been caused so that genuine friendship can be restored. We all know the problem of broken relationships in our world today. It's all too real for most of us. It affects us at differing levels throughout the world with varying effects, but the good news of the cross of Christ is that there is hope for every perceived irreconcilable situation to be restored. There is hope for every relationship that is broken. 
If God is able and willing to restore our relationship to him, then we have revealed to us his purpose and his goal for the whole of humanity, that every human being may know peace with God, that we may in turn bring peace with others. The task is huge, and we may therefore wonder where to begin. But we can begin where we are, with our own relationships, amongst ourselves, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our communities. Now this letter that has been written to the church in Corinth by Paul, he writes to them knowing that their relationship with him is not as it should be. And their relationship amongst themselves in this Christian community is also not as it should be. And so he writes to them and he says these words that we, that we read in verse 1 of chapter 6. He says, as God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Paul's concern for them, that having been on the receiving end of God's grace in Christ, that they were making a mockery of this grace and inhibiting the fullness of God's grace being experienced by conducting relationships with one another that weren't reflective of the message of reconciliation that they were sharing. So as well as this message being deeply encouraging, stirring us to give thanks to God, it's also deeply challenging for each one of us because what God calls us to in our personal relationships, whether it be in our homes between husband and wife or in our churches between differing groups of people amongst us, we are to actively work towards reconciliation because this is what God has done for us in Jesus. We have received grace that we may then offer grace to others. We are always to be, be pursuing a genuine bond between others, even where those relationships are strained or perhaps even worse. The cross teaches us that God is reconciling all things to himself in Christ. Christians, as Christ's ambassadors, are to communicate this message in word and in practice, in their relationships with one another. Consider this for a moment. How different would our relationships be were we to pursue reconciliation as God has pursued reconciliation with us? How different would our relationships be with one another when we consider how God has pursued us in Jesus Christ? As these verses teach us, it will require one person to take the initiative. It will take two parties to bring it about. Relationships that are cross-shaped would also require the injured party to receive justice as well as an acknowledgement of wrong from the one causing the offence. Forgiveness would need to be offered and need to be received. And this would be a continual and deliberate effort to not hold grudges. It would be costly. It would not be straightforward. But also, not impossible when the grace of God is at work. For where the grace of God is at work, so is the power of God at work. The cross carries with it a message of reconciliation and becomes also the power to bring that reconciliation about. This power makes friends of enemies. It welcomes and accepts the alienated and it heals the broken. This is not wishful thinking. This is the power of God. God does this. We cannot do it without him. And this is what the good news means for each one of us. On this earth, we will all be affected by the hurt and pain of broken relationships. But with God, through the work of his spirit amongst us, we can all know his reconciling grace at work in us, making all things new and giving the strength for us to pursue reconciliation in our relationships with one another. The grace of God in Jesus Christ is on offer to each one of us. 
that we may then work with him in offering this grace in our relationships at home, at work, in our communities and around the world. And this can be done today. The power of God's reconciling work in Jesus Christ is available to us today. For as the scriptures say, as we have read in these verses, now is the time of God's favour and now is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have taken initiative in Jesus Christ and you have rescued us. You have shown grace and mercy and you have offered us new life in Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for the salvation that comes in his name. Father, for those of us who are watching online that feel far from you, perhaps even may never, never have a relationship with you and are longing to know you, Father, may in this moment as they humbly come to you, as they acknowledge their wrong before you, receive them, welcome them and fill them with your Holy Spirit, that they may know you in Jesus Christ. For those of us whose relationship with God is currently causing us some form of dissatisfaction, Father, help us to address those areas of our lives that are inhibiting a fresh experience of your Holy Spirit at work within us. Grant us the grace to face those issues and lead us to a place of restoration in our relationship with God, a fresh vitality in our relationship with you. And then Father, in our relationships with one another, within church communities, within our city, across our nations. Father, May your spirit of reconciliation be at work. For those currently immersed in difficult, potentially broken relationships, we pray for restoration. We pray for your grace to sustain and we pray for a willingness amongst both parties of the relationship to long and work towards reconciliation. Heal broken hearts, Father. Bring restoration. Where people have become enemies by your spirit, cause them to be friends. Father, may all of us see our responsibility as ambassadors of Jesus Christ to constantly be offering grace to one another. Give us the courage to do so. Give us the strength to do so. As we trust in your grace, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Thanks for watching. Join us on Zoom to be part of our online community. And remember to stay up to date with the latest updates, follow us on our social media and our website and we'll see you next week.